If you open your Bible to me in Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, I want to do a message different from this morning's one. And uh, I want to speak tonight on overcoming rejection. I saw a great testimony tonight, someone who had a breakthrough in rejection. So uh, I want to just talk about that area and, uh, and give you just some keys just for breakthrough. It's an area that I have personally struggled with, lived with it all my life and uh, struggled, wrestled with it even as a pastor until God showed me what it was I was struggling and with and what I needed to do to push it off my life. And when I pushed it off my life, it was worth the battle because my life changed and transformed. But let's just start with the scripture here in Luke chapter 15 and verse one and two, where Jesus, is, uh, it's a very famous uh, set of stories. <clears throat> but in this, it begins off where it says, all the tax collectors and the sinners came to him to hear him. Everyone came to him. So notice it's interesting the way they categorize people. That in Jesus' day, the low people, the really bad ones were the tax collectors. They were considered the lowest, the most shame people in the community because they were Jews who worked for the Romans and took the taxes and creamed extra off the top. So they were considered. So if you ask, who's the worst people in our community? Oh, that's the tax collectors. Everyone else just lumped in the bundled sinners. And so that meant gay people and prostitutes and addicts and all the other things that were part of society, all just there labelled as just sinners. And it says, all the tax collectors and the sinners came to him to hear him. How about that? They all came to hear him. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to receive because he has words of life. Wherever we hear God's word speaking, this power to transform our life. And it says the Pharisees or the religious system, it says the religious people complained. And their complaint was this, that he made sinners welcome and that he ate with them. In a Hebrew culture, to eat with people is to extend honor to them. For the most important rabbi in the nation to eat with people was to extend great honor to them. And if you look in the ministry of Jesus and start to look through a cultural perspective of the Middle East, you'll see everywhere he, made, he went out of his way to put honor and value on people who had no honor and value. So notice that that's why it's written like this, because everyone understood what he was doing. He was treating people who the community despised, who the, uh, the religious world despised, who everyone despised. They struggled in their own life because they knew what they were like. And he said, I want you to know I'm representing my father and he welcomes you and he wants to add value to you and show you he's not ashamed to be with you. See, see, many times we read the scripture, we don't read through the, we read it through Western eyes and ca don't catch the picture. Like for example, the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. And of course, as a tax collector, he's not only the wealthiest person, he's the person with the most shame in the community. And so of all the people in the community, he's the one who's the lowest standing socially, even though he's got money, he's living with deep shame. In an honor shame community, what people wanted more than anything was honor and what he lacked more than anything was honor. He lived with deep shame. You can't get the honor yourself that easily. But what Jesus said, I want to come to your house to eat with you. In other words, I've chosen you the least honorable person in the community and I want to come and add value to you by eating with you and sharing with you. So, so constantly when you look through the ministry of Jesus, you'll find him reaching the most broken person to restore their honor, to lift them out of shame and to have them know you are of value, you are welcome. And uh, I won't go into teaching on the story, but I will come back to the story a little later. One of the issues that, that people struggle with everywhere, it's a significant issue, is the spirit of rejection. The Bible describes very clearly that there's not just a physical world, there's a physical world we live in, but there's also a surrounding spirit world that influences us. And it's not surprising that's the way because we're designed in the image of God. We're a spirit being with capacity to engage the spirit realm. We live in a physical body with capacity to engage the physical world. So we're designed for the spiritual to be a normal part of our life. But through the fall of Adam, uh, man became orphan. Man lost his father. And so he became like an orphan with a deep ache inside. So even in the most loving families and the most, even in the best family, you're born into this world with something missing. It's a God connection. 
And that's the area that the devil attacks us and causes the most distress and the most pain. It's the sense of being an orphan in life. And in the Bible, an orphan was someone with no father. They may have a mother, but if they had no father, there was no one to protect them. There was no one to provide for them. There's no one to promote them. There's no one to guide them in life, no one to instruct and discipline. They had no inheritance. They were vulnerable. And that describes very much spiritually the condition that we are in when we're born into this world. So even in the best of families, we are still spiritually orphaned until we engage God as our Father. Jesus came to engage us and show us that our Father's love is so deep, He will do everything He can to restore us back to relationship again. And so a person who's an orphan uh, has beliefs in the heart. The common belief is that I'm alone. I've got to do life on my own. And demonic spirits will torment people in a whole number of different ways. So when a person is uh, being harassed by a spirit of rejection, spirit of rejection influences your thoughts, influences the way you see life, influences your emotions, influences the way you respond. And it does it in several different ways. Let me give you three different ways. There are more, but let me give you three different ways. A strong spirit of rejection will influence people. Then we'll talk how it gains access to your life and what to do about getting free of it and becoming connected and encountering the love of God. Okay, so let's just talk about three things that it does. Rejection attacks who you are. A spirit of rejection is a demonic being, a spirit, it's part of a network of spirits, but it attacks your identity. It attacks your sense of identity, who I am. And it communicates a message that your identity is all attached to what people say about you, that your identity is attached to the possessions you have, that your identity is attached to the position you have. Your identity is attached to the things around you, your ministry success, your title, or whatever, external things. So a, a spirit of rejection will push you to believe that my personal value and my identity comes out of what's outside me rather than what's inside me. And if your identity is found in things outside you, you are always going to be vulnerable and manipulated by the circumstance and the people around you. If you are looking for the approval of people, then they have the power to manipulate you by withholding approval. If you're looking for recognition by people, they have the power to uh, hurt you and manipulate you by withholding recognition. If you gain recognition, you suddenly feel important. If you lose recognition or are criticized, suddenly it becomes overwhelming. So we have today a whole generation of people, the moment something is said that might be disagreeing with their opinion or might be a word of correction, they have a meltdown because their identity is not established. They're living in bondage to a spirit of rejection and related spirits. So a spirit of rejection will push you to get your identity established outside yourself. God wants your identity to be established on your relationship with Him. You think about Jesus, his first attack by the devil was if you are the Son of God, that's identity, then prove it by doing something, prove it by impressing people. And so when we are insecure, when, when we struggle with rejection, we become insecure in relationships. It affects all relationships. Second thing spirits of rejection train people to do is they, 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 they cause us, they distort our way of looking at life. They distort the way you see life and people. So a spirit of rejection, when it comes around your life, and it begins to attack you, you'll find the way you look at people and interpret life changes. We interpret life not through our eyes or our mind, we interpret through our heart. If your heart is wounded and carries a wound of rejection from some part of your past, then you will pass everything through the filter of your heart, asking this question, what did they mean when they said that? And your heart will reply, they don't like me, they don't want me. So something simple like a word of correction or someone trying to tell you something, your heart will say, what does that mean? And then it will answer it through its filter of rejection. They don't like me. They're against me. 
uh, you, you, uh, uh, someone is given uh, praise or someone is honored, and what does your heart say? It, it struggles straight away. It says, well, I should have that. That should be happening to me. And then we feel depressed and we can't rejoice in what other people are doing. So a, a spirit of rejection will work on the wounds of rejection in our heart to cause us to misinterpret life and misinterpret people. A third thing a spirit of rejection will do will hinder your ability to receive from God. It will do all it can to stop you receiving from God. Let me show you how and give you an example. Uh, Everything we receive from God comes by faith. I must believe that God will do what he says he'll do. So it's by faith we receive everything. In other words, and faith is in the heart. With the heart, man believes. So anything I want to receive from God, even an encounter with God, I must believe that He wants to do this and reach out and believe He'll do it for me. Rejection will allow you to believe God will do it for people, but not for you. You are the exception. This is for everyone else but you. It will actually literally, a spirit of rejection will couple with the spirit of unbelief to hinder you being able to move forward and believe God in finance, in your personal life, in even receiving from God. So I had a, an example, one of the classic examples. I had many like it, but I'll give you I'll give at least one. I was in a meeting, a very big Chinese meeting in Taiwan, and we had a great move of God and prayed for hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'm just on my way out. And as I'm on my way out, the Chinese lady jumps in front of me. Pass up, pass up, pray for me. And I think, oh, you know, I'm thinking I can't get around her. <laughs> She's in the way. We're the deacons. They're not taking any notice. They're, they're just, I'm on my own here. And, uh, and so I'm in, and, and there's a lot of dialogue goes on in my head in just a moment. The first, I'm tired. I just want to go home. And, and, and I know to get to pray for her, I can't just pray for her. I got a teacher or at least instruct her how to receive. And uh, so, so while I'm thinking all that, she adds to her story. And she'd, she'd said, oh, Pastor, I, want, to, I want, to, want you to pray for me to receive the gift of tongues and, uh, and baptism in the Spirit. And then she said, and many great men of God have prayed for me before and I never got the gift of tongues and I've never been slain in the spirit. And as she said, I heard, this is all I heard. Many great men before. I thought, oh, oh I'm just being set up for failure. You know, so now all that goes on in a very short time. It's like time freezes while it's there. What to do, what to do. Anyway, I said, God, you just got to help me. And the, and, the, and, and the Lord gave me a word of wisdom. I said, this is what I said to her. And what happened was just extraordinary. And I said to her, well, I want to first of all honor you that you've come up again after having so many disappointments by so many people and risking disappointment again, you have come asking God to do something. I said, I want to honor you for your perseverance. I said, that shows me that you are hungry for God's touch in your life. And that was a great help to do that. I said, now look, here's the scripture. God says, this promise is to you and to all who are far off. The word is clear. The gift is for you. You have come asking for the gift. God wants you to have the gift. But every time there's been prayer, you've never received. So I said, I believe there's a block to you receiving. God wants, you want but nothing's happening, something must be hindering. So I said, instead of me praying, why don't we ask the Lord, what is the block? And if we remove the block, then we'll see what God does. Because I knew if I just prayed, I'd just be another one on the list. <laughs> of the great men of God, and they're not so great. They all didn't do it, you know. So there it was. So anyway, I, I said, Lord, you've got to help me now. I said, oh, you had an issue with your father, didn't you? She said, yes. I said, you were deeply wounded because he abandoned you. She said, yes. And I said, because of the unforgiveness in your heart, you are locked into being rejected. And with the rejection has come unbelief. No one would want to give me anything. So I said, when you're approaching God, you're approaching through the filter of your hearts being rejected. And so even though you're asking and wanting in your heart, you don't really believe you'll receive. You are in agreement with the spirit of unbelief. 
and a spirit of rejection. I said, I want you to do this very simply. I said, I want you simply just to be willing to forgive your dad and I'll lead you in a simple prayer. I want you to do two things, forgive your father and I want you to break your agreement with those two spirits. Because spirits fill our mind with thoughts and they become so common they become our thoughts. We think they're our thoughts. It doesn't occur to us, maybe it's not from me, maybe it's from outside me, or maybe I've now come into agreement with it, so I'm now listening and a spirit is training me how to respond to life. So anyway, I pray, this is the prayer. This is how simple it was. I just led her in a prayer. Lord, my heart is hurt because of my father. I forgive my father and I break my agreement with rejection and unbelief. That was it. Very simple. Doesn't have to be complex. She was hungry and keen. She did it just like that. I put my hand on her head. I said, in Jesus' name, I break the agreement with rejection and unbelief. That's it. I didn't go into any big deliverance, anything like that. I said, now I want you to receive. And I said, in the past, I said, it's been like you've had, uh, like the doors of your heart closed. That's how you've lived your life. So I said, just put your hand like that. And she did that. I said, now I'm going to ask you to do three things. First, follow me in a prayer to receive the Holy Ghost. I said, when we get to the end of the prayer, I want you to do this. I want you just to open your arms wide, welcome the Holy Spirit in, take a deep breath, and then receive the gift of tongues and begin to pray. And she said, okay. So I led her in a simple prayer and she, she just, she was standing like that. She opened her arms and breathed in. And the moment she breathed in, the Holy Ghost came on her. She began to speak in tongues and she, she was slain in the spirit so strongly, I had to grab her and she pulled me off my feet. So I ended up, I'm sprawled on the ground, you know, <laughs> on the way out, wondering what's happened. But the power of God hit her so strong. Even what she hadn't asked for, she received. Because God knew it was the desire of her heart. I wonder how many people have been praying for things and asking God for things, but are not receiving. Wow. Are not receiving. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, or when it says, then believe you receive them. So rejection will couple with unbelief to keep you receiving. You'll always be watching others receive and walking away saying, what went wrong? And then your heart will tell you, oh, God doesn't love you. Or, okay, there's this problem in your life. Oh, you've been too bad. Oh, you did this. Oh, you did that. And you start to live in a cycle of being condemned all the time about everything. You're reminded of your failures instead of being reminded that at the cross, Jesus broke the power of that rejection and set you free from the sin and failure, made it possible for us to be free. So I, I, it's just really powerful. So we need to understand that God's heart is to connect to us. He's a father. So when Jesus, when Jesus uh, first announced his ministry, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've been anointed. And anointing is always for purpose. So if you want anointing, you must embrace purpose. God doesn't just dish out anointings for nothing. Anointings are to empower you so you can accomplish the divine design, what He designed you for. Every person is designed for intimacy with God, for representing God, and also to accomplish some assignment. So before the disciples, uh, before Jesus left His disciples, He made a promise in John chapter 14, and He said this. He said, I'm leaving, but He said, I will not leave you orphans. It's not God's heart to leave us orphans. You see, Jesus said, the Spirit of God is upon me, He's anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. Now, if I just relanguage that and put it like this, my Father has sent me to bring you a message that He loves you deeply and He wants you to come home. He wants you back in relationship with Him and He's made the way possible all you need to do is just have a change of mind. I was thinking wrong about him and I was thinking wrong about what was meaningful in life. I'm repenting and turning to him. And he said, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted because God doesn't just want you to come and have a salvation experience. He wants an intimate relationship. He wants you to know him as your father. So it says in Romans 8 verse 15 he said, he puts his spirit in us who will confirm with our spirits that we are children, beloved children of God. 
but many people don't understand one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to heal the issue of abandonment and rejection and to make his presence manifest in your life so you live aware, I am loved, God is with me. See, many people don't live that way. In their thinking, God is up there. In their consciousness, God is up there and we have to pull him down here or we have to do something to get him to come. No, Jesus did all the work. What is needed is for us to become aware of what has really taken place, that his spirit has come to live in us, always in us. Because he's always in us, he can move through us at any time. In other words, you're called to be a carrier of the presence of God. If you're carrying the presence of God, how can you be rejected if you're carrying his presence? See, the lie of that spirit, the lie of that spirit will mean you have to do something before God will do something. The Bible says very clearly, see, we just draw near to God, he will draw near to us. So how can I draw near to him? I must raise my awareness of the presence of God in me. And one of the ways we do that is praying in the spirit. Another way we do it is through uh, worship. And another way we do it through meditation. And then we become conscious of God's presence. We are carriers of his presence. If you're a carrier of his presence, then you can become conscious of him anytime, anywhere. Otherwise, you're thinking that God is in the church. But then we call the church the house of God. No, you are the house of God. When you are joined to the Spirit of God, you are not an orphan anymore. That's a lie of the devil. You're never going to be abandoned. He says in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you. I'll never abandon you. It's just the devil will come constantly and he'll attack the places of wounding so you resonate with the feeling, God isn't here, God is not with me. In other words, what you're conscious of is the demon pressing on you rather than conscious of the life of God within. You have to overcome the spirit of rejection. So because God is with us, once we receive the Holy Ghost, once we get baptized in the Spirit, then we're clothed in the Holy Ghost, God is with us. So no matter where we are, at any time, we can bring the presence of God. So we just bring the presence of God, just come. Just come quickly, just come and stand up. So it's not like it's a complex thing. See, I lived for years and what I was conscious of was the pain of not being acceptable. That was a hurt, it was a belief in the heart and it was a spirit. And when you have that in your heart and that spirit is working, then you can't feel the presence of God. It, you become conscious of being rejected all the time. It reminds you of that all the time. You gotta overcome it. And once you know the steps to overcome it and you overcome it, then you become conscious of God. And then it's much easier then to just pray and we just thank your Holy Spirit for your presence here. And the presence of God will just start to touch her in just a moment. There it is. One, two, three. Thank you, Lord. Touch her right now. The presence of God just comes on her life. You felt God. And you see what God's doing now. He wanted to heal you from grief. You're carrying grief in your life. And the grief is a big disappointment in a relationship that was very important to you. And you've struggled for quite some time now with the grief. Like you want to get rid of it, don't know how to get rid of it. And God wants you to know he loves you. He hasn't abandoned you. Not something wrong with you. You've lived with words of disapproval. You've lived with words spoken over your life that cause you to believe a lie that I'm not valuable. There's something wrong with me. God wants you to know in his eyes, you're a daughter of honor. You are deeply committed to him. You have sacrificed so many things to walk with him. You have, you've suffered because family have rejected your walk and have uh, raised pressure against you because you've decided to follow the Lord and not follow the religious tradition. And the Lord wants you to know he honors you. He's going to do some things in your life in this coming season. He's going to promote you. He's going to cause you to gain a breakthrough in your life well beyond what you've ever had before. He loves you deeply. He's seen how when pressure came to press you to change your decision to be part of this house, you resisted that pressure, even though you suffered because of it. And God sees those things 
and he's going to touch your life in a very powerful way. He's going to cause you to be a person who is not just involved in, uh, in, in the serving around the, 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 the teams, making things happen, working all those kind of things. He's going to use you to minister to brokenhearted people because that's where your passion really lies. You've got a passion for kids from broken homes. You've got a passion for street kids. You've got a passion for the people out there who never had any hope in life. And God's called you to minister to them. And so he's just taking you through a season in your life right now where he's, he, he's preparing you for that ministry. And uh, next year, you'll launch out into that ministry. You're going to find your whole ministry, man, uh, your assignment will start to shift in the coming year. And before now and then, uh, you're going to have, start to have some experiences with God. Uh, you're going to start to read and be drawn to stuff on deliverance and healing. As you've already started it. <laughs> you already have. You've started it. <laughs> I can see you've started it, and now it's starting to grip you, and you're thinking, oh, man, I want to do that. And God's going to do that. I want to lay hands on you now. I want to release what's on my life over you. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against the spirit of grief and rejection. I take authority over that root of rejection from your family of origin, from right back to the stage when you were conceived. I command that spirit of rejection loose. Thank you, Lord. We just release your presence. So we're carriers of the presence. We carry the presence. We carry the presence. And so it's not difficult to work with the Holy Spirit when you start to become conscious you carry his presence. Our problem is rejection robs us of that awareness and keeps reminding us of where we've failed or where we're lacking and where we're struggling. It keeps us, in our, it keeps us locked to the other side of the cross. And so we need to see how to get free of it. So let me just, if you, before I just share some keys out of it. So how is it we get wounded like this? How do you get wounded by rejection? What is this rejection thing? Uh, essentially, the core of it is a sense of being separated and alone, of not being acceptable in some way. And uh, so rejection is several things. Number one, it is a spirit. It's a spirit that torments along with other spirits that work with it. Number two, it's a wound that takes place when we encounter with people being rejected. Being rejected, not included, being excluded for some reason or another is extremely painful. It hurts us. No way you can say you're not hurt. It hurts. Jesus Therefore, was ex he experienced rejection so he could bring freedom to us from it. He has done the work for us to experience acceptance and learn how to live free inside from worrying what people think. So rejection is a spirit. Rejection is a wound we have when we're hurt by people. Rejection is also a belief you have in the heart about yourself. So it's a set of wrong beliefs. So rejection then is not just some simple thing. It's usually a group of spirits working together. They work on a place we're wounded in our heart. They work to stir and activate and plant wrong beliefs in the wounded heart, like putting an infection in a wound. And then they manipulate those beliefs constantly so you stay defeated. So, so where do people get wounded? Well, the wounds can happen so many different ways. They can happen in the womb. People, frequently, people are rejected. From the moment of conception, the person is a spirit being. They are aware whether they're welcome or not. From the very first moment, they're aware whether this pregnancy was a welcome pregnancy or unwelcome. See, they're aware if the mother has struggled or gone through trauma or gone through violent abuse during that season of the pregnancy. They're aware when, the child, when, when they're first born, whether they're welcome or not. So uh, we have prayed for children, uh, we've prayed for adults, and they were rejected from the womb. Their pain has gone right back to the very point of conception. They've struggled with it all their life. It can be just in the family through a divorce and the child's left alone. A child doesn't see things like an adult does. A spirit of rejection will train them to think, dad left because of me. There's something wrong with me. He doesn't want me. And so the dad's behavior may reinforce that belief until in the end, nobody really wants me. Something's wrong with me. I'm not accepted. It can be that there's a conflict in the parent, between the parents. Child lives in fear and tension, anxiety, and that creates a deep sense of rejection. If a parent is a controlling parent, they really watch over too closely, they give no freedom or they don't act, they don't talk and engage the child's emotions and feelings and thoughts, and the child shut down from expressing those, they learn that nothing I do and think and feel and believe is gonna count. I really don't count, I'm unacceptable. 
And so they learn to hide what they really think and feel and need. They hide their needs. Why? Because they reject, they're in agreement with the spirit of rejection. In communication, you are responsible to communicate what you think, what you feel, what you need, what you don't want. If you don't communicate that, how will someone know? So rejection undermines marriages and all relationships. It hinders us speaking out what we should be saying so the person understands where we're coming from. My job is to communicate what is inside me to you in a way you can understand it, not hope that you'll somehow pick the cues. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> okay, well, that's a, it's an issue. So, so uh, if people have been abused, sexually abused, this creates huge traumas and rejection because they have been violated, their boundaries have been violated. A controlling person will violate your boundaries all the time. That's why you always feel rejected and then struggle with boundaries. Uh, uh, being criticized, cr uh, constantly criticized, the person believes after a while, nothing I do is good enough, and they, they conclude that I'm not good enough and not acceptable. So there's a whole range of lies come with these wounds. We can be rejected at school. We can be rejected because we're not physically fit like others. Uh, rejection can take place on puberty when you're very sensitive about your body and you grew too quick or you didn't grow quick enough, and it leaves a great embarrassment and shame around the life because of how everyone ridiculed and made fun of you. So the devil's weapon is to use ridicule to cause us to feel rejected and not part of things. And so it's, th this is the strategy of the devil because he can get you to believe the lies of rejection and be trained by the spirit of rejection. You will never fulfill all that God has for you. You'll always hold back your dreams. You see, God puts dreams in your heart. He puts desires in your heart. But if you reject yourself, if you bury what's in your heart and your heart is wounded by rejection, how can you bring your dreams out? Every time you bring one out, you live in fear it'll be rejected. You'll, you'll be reluctant to step out and take it because you don't think it'll work. Because nothing I do is good enough anyway. And so, so what happens is people become compliant and enter dysfunctional relationships or settle for less than they could be. This is a very, very painful issue. We can go through this uh, rejections when there's family breakups, when there's betrayal in a relationship. It's one of the deepest, deepest forms of rejection you can experience when someone you were in love with betrays you and is unfaithful. That is probably one of the deepest wounds that could ever take place. And it can take quite some time to get over. Not the forgiving part, that's, that's okay, we can move to that. It's can I trust again? Now, how will people treat me again? Uh, even when people come into a room, the first thing they're looking for is, is the atmosphere here accepting of me? They're very sensitive to any disapproval of any kind. People are, they just feel it. They feel it straight away. You see, if you're judging someone, if you look and you pass a judgment on them, they can feel that. Acceptance is something that flows from our spirit. It's something that can be felt. That's why God wants to fill us with His love, set us free from the spirit of rejection, heal the wounds of rejection, so we're free to receive love and to give love. The Bible says the love of God, the love we receive from God, flows from our heart to touch others. But if your heart can't receive, you'll also use your relationships to try and barter to get what you need and it never works. So there's so many different ways that we can be hurt. Even in churches, people can be deeply hurt by legalism. Legalism or religious spirit will tell you that unless you look this, do this and don't do that, you can't be acceptable. That's why the religious leaders complained about Jesus. They're saying he's bucking the system. He's going against the system. We've got the system. These people aren't acceptable. And Jesus made them all welcome. He made everyone welcome. He didn't agree with their lifestyle. He said, I want you to know my Father loves you so deeply. He welcomes you in spite of your mess. He's not afraid of your mess. He can fix your mess. He wants to fix your mess. He just wants you to come home. There's no barrier to coming home except the one in your heart. And then he demonstrates it so powerfully with the story of the prodigal son. I won't go into all of it, but if I just take one verse, and that is verse 20, Luke 15, verse 20, and it says, and the son rose to go back to his father. 
You've got to understand he's been living with pigs. He's been feeding the pigs. He smells like the pigs. His clothes are in tatters. His life is a mess. He's in a place of shame. The community, if they see him, are all going to reject him. So he's got fear in his heart. And as he walks down, his one question, which is the question of a rejected person, will I be accepted or not? And he's trying to negotiate his way to be accepted. He doesn't even really believe his father will accept him. He's saying, listen, could you have me back so I can work for you and make some more money and get myself out of this mess? He's not even thinking like his father will accept him. He just knows that being with his father would be better off than where he was. He's coming to trade. Can I do a deal? And it says this, it's the most moving scripture to me in the whole Bible, one of them anyway, one of the most moving, because it's the revelation Jesus brings of what our Father is like. There are other revelations. People don't get what God's like. They have our concept of God and we see Him through the filter of a Father, which is often not a very good filter because there's a lot of pain there. But when, when God spoke to Moses, God said, this is what I'm like. I'm the Lord, the Lord God. I'm the eternal, uh, self-existing, almighty one. Then he says, and I'm compassionate. I am moved by the plight of people and want to engage to help them. I am merciful, compassionate. I am gracious. I have the power to help you and lift you up and bring you out of the mess. And I want to do it. I'm long-suffering. You can't get me angry easily by your messes and your failures. I am abounding in goodness or loving kindness and truth. I, I'm very careful to maintain loving kindness to people to demonstrate this is who I really am. I forgive iniquity, transgression and sin, but even still, I'm still a God of justice. And so Jesus said, this is what Father's like when He saw the young man coming to Him the Father was moved with compassion. See, when you see someone who's broken, you'll either judge them in your heart or you'll be moved with compassion. If there's rejection in your heart, you'll blame them and judge them. But if you've encountered the love of God and are free of rejection, you'll carry His heart, just compassion. You start to feel their pain. See, as I was ministering, I, I knew nothing about the situation. But as I ministered, I started to feel her heart and feel the pain and then started to become aware of the longings. You see, that's how God's designed us to live. The Father was moved with compassion and He recognised the community would reject His Son. And so He did what no older person would do in the Middle East. He girded up His garments and He ran to Him. And when He met Him, He fell on Him and hugged Him and kissed Him and restored Him. That's our Father. That's what His acceptance looks like. Now our thinking is, I've got a bargain to get it. I've got to do something to get it. But the Bible tells us very clearly, this is the truth, that at the cross, Jesus has made us accepted, made the abused person accepted, made the criminal accepted, made the violent person accepted, made the person who's been rejected accepted. He's done all the work if I can just believe in my heart and remove the barrier that stops me receiving. The Father ran to him and hugged him and immediately restored him into sonship put his ring on his hand, the ring of authority, put his best robe, his own robe over him and put shoes on him symbolizing, you're not a servant, you're my son and I love you and I'm not ashamed of you. And many people are struggling with shame. Sometimes it's religious shame, sometimes the shame of failure and defeat, but God says, no, I welcome you like you are. If you get involved in sexual sin, one of the biggest hassles apart from the addictive and the spiritual side of it is the shame. But this man smelt of pigs and God put his arms around him and said, I love you. You can't shock him or stop him. The only thing that'll hinder is that lying demon of rejection when it gets with unbelief that causes you to think, yeah, I guess so for everyone else, but not for me. I'm different, I'm too bad. So let me just give you a few simple steps. Just the key of it is to see what Jesus did at the cross. At the cross, every area of failure, 
every area you could suffer, your shame, the rejection, the abandonment, the suffering, the sorrow of a broken heart, the sorrow of being abused and put down, the sorrow of being betrayed, anything you could experience, Jesus as your representative took it to the cross. And what He's asking for you to do is to believe He's done everything needed for you to be accepted. If you can just exchange what you have and receive from Him what He wants to give you. So the cross is an altar. The cross is a place of exchange. So if I'm going to come to be free of rejection, I need to recognize that I am suffering from this thing in my life. I need to acknowledge this is what I'm struggling with. This thing is affecting my ability to love my wife, love my children, love my friends. It's affecting me to even receive from God. It's affecting me everywhere. So I made a decision. I'd war against it until I'd overcome it. And part of that was to acknowledge the pain of being rejected, each person, and bring it to the cross and forgive and bless them. Unforgiveness keeps you anchored to rejection. It ties you to rejection. Oh, but it's not fair what they did. You know, they need to be punished. No, 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 no. Your unforgiveness keeps you tied to the drama and stops you receiving what God has. It leaves you open to torment. Second thing is, I must break my agreement with spirits of rejection and abandonment and unbelief and self-pity, whatever it is that I have allowed to come around my life. For some people, we found a way of fixing the pain by addictive behaviors and whatever. We need to abandon them. The real problem is I want just to feel this pain taken away. So I need to bring the pain to the cross, release forgiveness, break my agreement with those kind of spirits that are there and choose to believe that God can set me free. And then you need to renew your thinking. And the way I did that for me, this took about three or four weeks to do. And what I did was every day for three or four weeks, I'd pray strongly in the Spirit. I'd begin to just release blessing and forgiveness to those who had hurt me. And I spoke to the spirits that I recognized were pressing on me. Fear of rejection, rejection, self-rejection, unbelief, self-pity. I would decree to them, your power is broken by the cross of Jesus. I have authority, I break your power. And I would take time to just meditate that Jesus loves me very deeply. Put the picture in my mind and heart and begin to meditate and meditate and pray in the Spirit and worship and say, this is the truth. No matter what I feel, this is the truth. I'm embracing the truth. I'm letting the truth get into my heart. I reject those lies of rejection. I'm believing the truth. It takes time to nurture the truth. And then I got a breakthrough. One day I felt the demons go and I felt the presence of God come. And I just began to weep because I'd encountered the living God. I'd encountered His love as a father. And I now carried an encounter in my life. Everywhere I went from that time on, I can bring the love of God. It's a revelation I live with now, not something I have to do. If people don't like me, well, that's too bad. Don't worry. I've got someone who does love me. I've spent time with him and he told me he loved me. He told me he loves me every day. If people don't think this is the right thing, well, it's okay. Uh, okay, but my father's telling me what to do. See? So there's a freedom comes in living that way. Thank you for tuning in, church. We hope this message reached your heart and was one in season for you. We're eager to hear how God is moving in your world. If you have a praise report or prayer request, send us an email at online at c3sandiego.com to share. Also, to partner with us financially so we can reach people all over the world, go to c3give.com. We know you'll be blessed by your giving. Thanks again, church, and until next time, we'll see you soon.